1990s five channel surround system. Hi, I'm Vince. Welcome to my Vince Unlimited YouTube channel. Thank you for joining me here. In this video, I should be telling you all about my Hi-Fi AV setup in the 90s. You may have already watched my previous two videos in this tech series. The first one showcasing my Pioneer Hi-Fi system in the 1980s. And then the video about my first attempt at creating a rudimentary surround sound setup in my Denon based AV system in the mid 1980s. Links to these videos can be found in the description below, along with your chance to subscribe to this channel and to catch other videos and to encourage me to keep uploading content. In this particular video, I, with the help of photographs I actually took of my setup at the time, shall show you how my system developed in the 1990s when widescreen technology appeared along with multi-channel AV digital surround sound systems, laser disc players, reference grade speakers and eventually digital set-top boxes. Then after showing the equipment I had curated, I'll run through all the prices I paid at the time and initially show the equivalent value at current market rates, just as I did with the previous two videos in this series. So let's first remind you of my hi-fi journey to date. In 1981, my wife Linda and I had purchased a new one-mate top-of-the-range stereo system from Pioneer and set it up next to our small colour portable TV in our lounge. It was smart looking, very effective at reproducing the good sound from its cassette deck tuner and record deck sources through its 130 watt amplifier which powered some quite remarkable big cabinet floor standing speakers. The system highlights it included a direct drive turntable, a cassette deck with Dolby B noise suppression, a 7 band stereo graphic equaliser and a 300mm diameter bass drivers in the three way speaker delivering thumping bass down to a rumbling 35Hz. The main downside was that although it was placed adjacent to our TV the two systems had no interconnection so we eventually decided to upgrade to a rudimentary AV system of our own design. Our denim based AV system comprised of a contemporary flat screen style 22 inch CRT TV matched to individually curated components mainly from denim. We added in brand new technology in the form of a Philips CD player alongside a high end hi fi VHS video cassette recorder, a hi fi level turntable, a new cassette deck now with Dolby C, a matching tuner, and a 2x twin channel 400 watt amplifier. We had ditched the graphic equaliser component but kept our beloved Pioneer speakers. The twin stereo amplifier allowed us to repurpose our portable TV as a bedroom setup along with a pair of new bookshelf speakers, although these speakers were eventually repositioned to an, our main lounge when we moved to create an effective but limited surround sound system. This setup served us well until when in the 1990s we noticed that TVs were growing in size and true digital surround sound amplifiers were available so we set about updating our system again. This would provide us with a much improved home film watching experience as well as better musical reproduction. Nowadays, widescreen TV screens are normal, but this wasn't always the case. It was more common into the late 1990s for TV screens to be a standard 4x3 format. The aspect ratio was dictated by the fixed central point scanning cathode ray tube, with steering control across and down the screen using electromagnetism to fast scan lines across one by one. This central point resulted in a slightly convex outer glass shell which became more obvious when TV screen sizes started to increase. There was some development in the beam focusing in the late 1980s to produce flatter screens dictated by the emergence of computer screens which were normally viewed from a much closer distance. This technology was also used by some newer TV sets and we ourselves had a monitor style Panasonic as described in my previous video. However, by the 1990s, Sony had produced a widescreen CRT variant of 16x9 proportions, and we bought a 28 inch one, a Trinitron KV-W2812U. At first it looked very big in our lounge, but in reality it wasn't actually an enormous screen. A 28 inch 4x3 TV would give screen height of 16.8 inches or 427 millimeters, but our 28 inch TV only had a height of 13.7 inches or 348 millimeters, hardly more than a portable. It was the width and the sheer bulk that was impressive, not the height. It was so heavy it took both of us to lift it into position and the custom crafted handmade wooden cabinet that Linda's dad had made. It contained groundbreaking technology, widescreen home viewing was rare when we had it so it featured automatic conversion modes to mimic a widescreen effect from the usual square of 4x3 broadcast format. 
modes such as full screen fit, stretching the original broadcast signal wider, which looked faintly ridiculous, and a zoom facility to fully fill the screen if films were broadcast in widescreen format with the black bars top and bottom. However, it is at best when fed from a dedicated widescreen source, so we invested in the best one available at the time. Another emerging new technology. We purchased a Pioneer CLD 1950 laser disc player to play proper widescreen films in our own home. This impressive technology, with its stunning foot-wide, solid, big CD look-alike discs, provided a far better sound of vision than the standard VHS tapes at the time with about 50% more video resolution lines and CD equivalent audio reproduction. But they did suffer from an obvious background mechanical slashing sound due to the high spinning speed of the big discs. Our player was chosen because of its ability to play CAV as well as CLV discs. We didn't choose the top of the range model which provided auto reverse changeover in order to avoid unnecessary further complication. LaserDisc CAV format was designed to provide clear freeze frame functionality, but the specialist discs were even more expensive than the standard CLV ones, which couldn't do freeze frame. These normal discs were already relatively expensive at around 15 to 20 pounds per film, but CAV encoded discs were up to 50 pounds to purchase, and these were 1990 prices. Imagine paying over 120 pounds today to be able to own a single film and having to flip the disc over midway. Note that the cheaper to produce well-known DVD format hadn't yet arrived at this time. Laserdisc reproduction uses an analogue video storage system, then the signal is converted to digital for processing and the outputted back as an analogue video but with the option of digital sound, hence our first understanding and use of a delicate digital fibre optic cable. To run the Laserdisc output using its optimal digital output we added another separate component, a digital to analogue converted, or DAC. This little cute DAC in a box shown here because neither our receiver nor TV had a digital input source. However, if you think about it, we were talking an analog disc that used an inbuilt analog to digital converter to output a digital signal into an off-board digital to analog converter in order to feed an analog input into an analog amplification device. But it did sound good. Because of using the same red laser components, the laser disc also played standard audio CDs pretty well which sat in a reduced size disc holder as part of the big mechanical front-loading tray. So we sold our beloved dedicated Philips CD player to a guy who owned one CD at the time, a rendition of Come On You Reds, a Liverpool football anthem. Imagine hearing that loud on replay for a couple of days. The other source of films was our video cassette player, and more pre-recorded films started to be offered in widescreen format. This is the main reason we changed our impressive VHS Hi-Fi JVC top-end machine to an SVHS specification Panasonic NV-HS1000B. Plus, I had just invested in a new Sony CCD V5000E Hi-8 camcorder and higher definition VCR meant I could now edit in better quality, 400 as opposed to 250 lines, which was touted at the time as broadcast quality. And in fairness, watching on a modern widescreen TV today, albeit in washed out colour, blurry edging and suspect random digital artefacts. Externally it seemed less impressive than the JVC with its plain front case looks, but when the whole front panel dropped, it revealed its features such as a jog wheel for precise video editing and a dedicated 16x9 widescreen output slider. Although we were upgrading our system, we did reuse some of our existing components. There was no need to change our Denon TU747L tuner. After all, specifications for radio receivers were already well established. It did the medium wave, long wave and FM bits as well as any other similarly priced one would and a DAB was yet to arrive and give us the reason to upgrade. In any case, it was still in an as new condition. Plus, as mentioned in my earlier video, we did not use it much because all the other shiny new components we had been gathering together and this tradition continued. Similarly, we didn't update our cassette deck, our Denon DRM33. It was in as good as condition as our tuner was, despite being a well-used component and was still able to produce a clear, relatively hiss-free sound, particularly when using chrome or metal tapes. Ask your father, or grandfather, or Mr Google. We never had the facility to measure technical precision on the deck transport, but suspect it hardly wowed and barely fluttered. And our J.A. Michel Focus One record deck was kept with its light springy feet supporting the solid, shiny black base slab. Along with its mission arm and Autophon MC10 moving core cartridge, it still performed as beautifully as it looked, provided that vinyl disc laden it were of reasonable quality. 
The second reason we upgraded our system was the emergence of multi-channel signal processing on mid-range amplifiers, and we wanted a true AC3 surround unit. We liked the surround sound effect we had already created ourselves with the twin pair of speakers using our big pioneers as a front stair and a small emissions as rears, but it was not true surround sound. We had already experienced the beginnings of digital sound processing with the Dolby A and B tape hiss suppression, firstly on our Pioneer and then Dolby C on our Denon cassette deck, but true multi-channel surround sound systems with all-round Dolby encoded sound processing were not available until the early 1990s. We auditioned the latest equipment, our, our local hi-fi dealers once more, and settled again for a Denon receiver. We still like the sound produced. No, it was called a receiver rather than an amplifier. This is because the Denon, AVC 2800 we chose, switched and processed both the connected oral and visual components. It was indeed a huge complex lump of machine, but didn't have a tuner built in, uh, despite its vacuum fluorescent display. Uh, this mainly advertised the source of component chosen. And it was well stocked with rear connections in order to facilitate connecting them all, including RCA connectors, S-video connectors, speaker banana plug speeder, wire clips and a coax plus a power input lead all controlled by the many front-mounted buttons and a beautifully weighted oil-slick volume controller in conjunction with the multitude of other buttons, dials and connectors hidden under the lower flap or from one or more of the 38 colourful buttons on the remote control if you exclude the other 21 buttons located behind the remote's flip panel door. It's as well I am an operating manual reader given all that functionality. The Denon included digital settings for its acoustic sound processing, which was another interesting feature for us to learn about. The preset modes included quite effective renditions of sound spaces, including making it sound like you're sat inside a big stadium with the sounds hollowing around with spacious echoes or bellowing around a rock arena or a jazz club, which may or might, may not have been accurate. I've no clue having never ventured into such a den of iniquity, along with a standard Dolby Pro Logic control setting. We enjoyed trying out the sound modes, which did make quite a difference, but listening to music bouncing around a vast rock arena while sat in a comfortable sofa in your little lounge is a bit weird, so we generally settled for using the Dolby Pro Logic mode when listening to TV and movies. It added some punch without the falsified processing. However, when listening to pure stereo music, we generally preferred an unmolested classic basic stereo sound using the pass-through sound mode. To achieve this, there was a tone defeat button amongst the many on the remote. We were learning that good quality music sound does not actually need any process in a good system, but we like the fun enhancements whilst watching films and TV, which inherently have a more artificial sound experience. After all, if you can accept that a helicopter is flying from left to right in front of you, whilst sat in comfort holding your tea, you can buy into the deep throbbing sound moving with it. The major limitation to hearing these effects was from our actual living room setup. We could appreciate the wide stereo separation it gave us, but our room lacked the depth to be able to put the rear speakers truly behind us. In fact, the left rear speaker was far too close to us, meaning an artificially loud left channel surround sound, which could not be catered for by the balance controls. In fact, it was when we were testing this, we discovered that the included Dolby Digital 3.1 processing was a four channel design with a mono surround comprising left, center, right, and dual mono surround. Something else to note was that our initial Denon dual stereo amplifier had a 2x2 two 100 watt power output, providing a total of 400 watt maximum output. Our replacement Denon surround sound receiver had three front channels of 110 watts, peak power coupled to a pair of 30 watt rears, giving a total of 390 watts over the four channels. However, given the 330 watt maximum bias towards the front sound, then we didn't notice the missing 10 watts. Speaker-wise, we finally upgraded our two Pioneer main speakers for ones that could outperform them after carrying out a long search to find something with a similar sound, but better. We had to go to a pair of KEF Reference Model 2 speakers to make this significant difference, so good that the Pioneers were. It was our first knowledge of the term reference, which was used by high-end manufacturers to denote the finest equipment they could produce, regardless of cost. The idea being to set a standard reference point for their product's audio quality, setting a benchmark to which our other products should attempt to attain as best as possible given their lesser budget build restrictions. As a result, performance on reference products was first class and so very satisfying. However, 
As if to prove manufacturers' quoted performance stats are not always the final byword for comparison, the dynamic range of these new KEF reference speakers went from 43 Hz upwards compared to the incredibly low 38 Hz achieved by the Pioneers. Uh, both went to 20,000 Hz top end, but that was commonly achieved by most speakers because beyond that only the local deer could appreciate it. The KEFs were used in conjunction with our fine sound in mission bookshelf speakers to provide the surround or rear surround sound demonstrating just how good they were, but we also needed to find a suitable centre speaker to manage the fourth channel. We settled on the smallest KEF reference centre speaker available, the Model 100. But although it was several grades better than using the TV itself as a centre source, it still disappointingly failed to match the actual reference quality of the majestic floor standing KEFs. The reason we chose the Model 100 rather than the wider 200 was that in our setup it had to be precariously balanced on top of our widescreen TV because the shelf below was only designed big enough for our new VCR. This positioning, along with the big adjacent KEF left channel, floor stander and all their powerful driver magnets, actually caused the CRT screen to cast an ugly green hue over time. We had learnt something else, that TVs positioned close to big speakers with their big driver magnets not comfortable bedfellows and that to reset the phenomenon we had to degauss the TV once in a while which could be done through some setup menus or by simply powering off the TV for a little while. By now with the expenditure we were making on the components of our system we were starting to learn about specialist interconnects and speaker cabling. It all sounded a bit like bringing more cash from the gullible at first but the problem was that even companies such as Denon only provide the most basic of interconnects using thin copper wired encased in a flimsy plastic shrouding with cheaply produced end terminations. Higher end systems could benefit from the experience of specialist cabling companies who knew how to maximise performance by reducing losses through analog cables and we listened to the results in audio tests to confirm this. In fact you could even alter the sound of the whole system by judicious selection. Specialist interconnects and speaker wire could release a better sound but naturally added a new way to dip into my pocket. In the end, we only spent out on a mid-range flat cable for our speakers, partly because of the lengths needed, a half-decent optical cable to suit the DAC, and some extended connectors to link between our TV, VCR and remotely stacked components due to how we had our lounge laid out. But the scene had been set for future even better systems. We would inevitably be treading this path of expensive specialist interconnects at some time. And guess what? You'll have to subscribe to my channel to be prepared to see future videos of all that in due course. Although we spent a great deal of time auditioning and selecting our upgraded system components, we didn't change things up that often. But sometimes technology comes along that doesn't fit in with our scheduled buy-in timescale. An example of this is the upgrade we made in the late 1990s when broadcast digital television finally reached the south. It made sense to be one of the first on board as we had a good widescreen TV and great sound and AV system to benefit from it. So in 1998 we invested in one of the first DTVs, a Philips on digital player. On Digital was a forerunner to Freeview but as a subscription service. Finally, we were free of the limited five broadcast channels and I had a device that offered several stations to choose from, although mostly just specialist versions of BBC, ITV and Channel 4 at first. The standout channel was Film 4, which was the first source of regular new full-length feature films that we had, and many were broadcast in a widescreen format. The din and processing and amplification with the reference grade speakers really suited each other and the overall clarity and bass response was significantly better than our previous setup. In our audio tests we were looking to maintain the warm broad sound of the Pioneer and Denon combination we had previously and the Denon stroke KEF match provided this perfectly. However it wasn't a full 5.1 system as we would know today as we didn't incorporate any form of subwoofer relying instead of the solid deep performance of the KEF main speakers. Crucially, we still had our favoured sound, but now with added depth. However, the real change we noticed was the wide 16x9 format that is commonplace today. The new sources such as the Laserdisc, SVHS video cassette player and eventually the DTV really helped lift overall production values, particularly making film viewing more immersive and thus engaging. So let's run through what we actually ended up with and chart out the price we paid at the time along with a comparison in today's market or more precisely the approximate value in 2022 because exact inflated prices to this current year are yet to settle. These figures are the best I could access given memory, actual records and research carried out. Note that everything we bought was brand new so this helped with my assessments. Firstly the widescreen TV. This is a Sony Trinitron 28 inch widescreen CRT model costing us around £500 in the early 90s equivalent to around £1240 in 2022. 
the digital television receiver was a Philips on digital unit. Note the price is dated around 1998, which is when these were first available to us. The surround receiver was a Denon AVC 2800 and cost us about £800, including the remote, valued equivalent at around 1980 in 2022. The tuner was the one we purchased in the mid-1980s from Denon, a TU747L. We also kept our Denon DRM33 cassette deck, first obtained in the 1980s. We added a Pioneer CLD1950 laser disc player, which cost us around £600 in the 1990s, around £1490 today. The value was similar to our price we paid for our record deck six years earlier, the J.A. Michel Focus 1. Although with that we had to add a tone arm and cartridge, another £300 worth. All this makes a subtotal value of £2,900, or a modern equivalent of over £8,000. We haven't yet included the speakers. So let's move on to our second page. Firstly, we carried forward the first page subtotals. Now add in the video cassette player, an SVHS Panasonic NVHS 1000B, at a cost of another £500 or £1240 nowadays. Again, a high-end model with a high-end price for the now-established VHS range recording format. Our system included a small digital to analogue converter for the laser displayer to output via its optical audio port. Onto the speakers and our front stereo speakers with a KEF Reference Model 2 which cost us around £1,200, equivalent to at least £3,000 today, so by far the most expensive component in our system. The allegedly matching KEF Reference Model 100 centre speaker was equivalent in price at £700, 1740 today, but nowhere near equivalent in performance. However, all reference models well outperformed our repurposed Mission Bookshelf speakers, which in fairness only cost us £100 in the 1980s. For personal listening, we used a pair of Pioneer headphones that we bought in the mid-80s for about £30. As discussed, we supplemented our speaker setup with the matching long speaker cables, which are a flat style from Waterfond, costing about £200 or £500 in today's prices. Then added some other replacement interconnects, such as the optical cable and long leaves, which I've included a probable £50 more. All this adds up to a system that costs us around 5760 to build, or the equivalent of 15480 in 2022. And if you think that's expensive, you're right, actually equating to around 60% of our joint annual income at the time. In fairness, we were reusing some older components which we had purchased earlier. However, you might well correctly conclude that this hobby was becoming a bit of an obsession for us. It would be into the 2000s before we made another major upgrade, but at least we had a really wonderful four-channel surround sound AV system to enjoy until then. But we weren't finished, and we continued to adapt our system beyond the 90s as technology moved on, and our resources allowed. And I plan to film new videos about this for the series in due course. Might I suggest you subscribe to my channel to make sure you don't miss this. Please add a like to let me know that I'm doing this right. I look forward to any comments you have on our choice of components and your own experiences of similar systems. Meanwhile, thanks for watching through to the end of this video. It means a lot to me. I look forward to seeing you all again. Bye for now.